Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kess Knight. I'm the Associate Director of Digital Marketing at ACRO, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar presentation titled, How to Write a STEM Plan, Something for Everyone. And before we get started, I'd like to add a quick note on logistics. There will be time for Q&A at the end of the session, so please type your questions in the chat box throughout the session, and I will read them aloud for the presenters to address. Um, you can type the questions, like I said, anytime, and I'll hold them until the end. And Tom, I will pass it over to you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Tom Green. I'm the Associate Executive Director for Consulting and STEM at ACRO. Uh, I've got about 30 years of uh, education experience in higher ed. And uh, prior to my role at ACRO, I was the Dean or Vice President of Enrollment Management at Seven. Uh, colleges and universities across the United States. Presenting with me today is Dr. Karen Miller. Karen? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Karen Miller. Um, I'm currently serving as the Provost uh, and Executive Vice President at Cuyahoga Community College in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, uh, I've, only, I've been in this role for about four months now uh, and uh, have served prior to that as the Vice President for Enrollment, Student Affairs, and Institutional Research here at the institution, um, held, a, held a number of roles here at the college, all invo involving enrollment management, and uh, uh, have about 25 years of experience in the Student Affairs and Enrollment Management arena. Um, we thank you for joining us today, and I will turn it back over to Tom to get us started. Great. Thanks, Karen. Okay, so uh, in front of you, uh, you should see on your screen as I move forward, there we go. Uh, we're going to talk about these areas today. We've got about six topics to cover, so we're going to move through this content and we're going to try and present some depth on this. But as, you're, as we're going through, please jot down some questions you might want us to ask at the end of the, you might want to ask us at the end of the uh, webinar today. So we're going to talk about organizational and cultural issues. We're going to talk about trends across higher ed and your sector of higher education. Uh, unique pressures at, at institutions. Everybody has some things that are unique. Uh, many of us have uh, things that are not unique, common to us all. We're going to talk about the role of research and analysis in STEM planning, uh, developing clear and measurable goals and expected outcomes, and then finally kind of take a look at the content of a STEM plan. What, what does a STEM plan really look like? So let's dive into topic number one, organizational and cultural issues. We've identified four areas that we want to talk about today. Leadership, participation, clarity of roles, and reading your institution's culture. I'm going to ask Karen to please step in and talk a little bit about leadership. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, obviously, um, this is a, a major project for any institution. Um, sometimes a tough one to get started if you don't if you don't have a history of of writing a strategic enrollment plan. Um, uh, not the easiest thing to tackle. It's not something that you do in isolation, obviously, and really requires um, the buy-in, the support of everybody at the institution, most particularly um, your your president. And so. Um, it really it, it is it is not an effort that you can do um, in isolation, and you can do successfully without full institutional support. Uh, so it's just really imperative that your chief executives, um, your college president, provost, um, uh, whoever that might be, is really on board and fully supports um, this work, um, and not only in in concept but also in communication. Um, it is it is um, important that this this effort be kicked off appropriately. It is a big, big effort. Uh, it really can't be done without um, very widespread buy-in. And, um, and so really, depending on your institutional makeup, uh, whether you are one college, whether you are a multi-campus institution, um, however, that, however that plays out for your particular institution, really important that you have a cross-cultural uh, cross mix of people. Um, uh, so important to establish that up front. Um, uh, important to have buy-in from the top. And then thirdly, important that, that this project is tied to the, to the strategic plan of the institution. You need to explain to people the relevance of, of why this is an important project. 
it takes a great deal of time, effort, and work to put together a solid um, STEM plan. And so if people don't really understand why you're doing it um, and what it, what it means to the institution, you'll have a really tough time getting the commitment that you will need to make it happen, to make it happen correctly. This really can be a roadmap for the institution that lays out uh, your, your plans around recruitment, retention, completion, how, however you define that, whatever terms that you use, um, it, it really can be that plan that connects all the dots. Um, and, and in order to do that, you really need to make the case for the relevance. If you don't have that, really, you'll really have a tough time making this happen and doing and doing it justice. And if and it's and again, way too much work to do if you're not going to make sure um, that you do it right the first time. And so, um, so all those things are important in creating that SEM plan. Um, again, um, you know, in terms of the mix of people that you bring to the table, every, every college is different in this respect. And um, your structure will determine who needs to be part of that process. But you need to really think broadly. It's got to be more than just student affairs people, more than just enrollment people. Important that you have faculty involved in this process, uh, faculty in the classroom, front lines on the ground. Um, uh, important both in terms of knowledge and expertise, also important politically. Um, you may even have students involved in the process. Um, again, important to make sure you've got your constituents at the table. Um, also important to have a mix of folks um, from the ad administration, uh, your business and finance folks, people that are, that are putting dollars to enrollment, people that are, that are um, proposing budgets. Uh, your um, your marketing and communications team, all those folks. So a good mix of faculty administrators and staff, business and finance, IR folks, all of those people bring a certain level of expertise and information to the table that are vital in helping build that plan. Um, and the more uh, cross-college, cross-campus um, buy-in that you have, the more support you're going to have, uh, the more commitment that you're going to have to the project, uh, and it will obviously help you with communication. If you do this in isolation, um, you just, you, you're just not going to get the, the outcome that you need um, you know, to have a robust plan. You, can't, you, you may be able to create pieces and parts of it um, by yourself, but you really need to have all the information from that collective group um, to build a solid plan moving forward. Um, the, the one thing I would also suggest for those institutions that maybe haven't done this before, um, and, I, and I'm sure there are some. Um, if you don't have a history of this, you really, you've, got to t you've, you've got to take a stand and start somewhere. You, you may not be able to pull every piece and every component um, together for the first time, but I would encourage you to start somewhere. If you, it, it really does help provide the direction um, and the tie to the strategic plan that you need to really get everybody on the same page around recruitment initiatives, enrollment numbers and projections, uh, retention initiatives and, uh, um, and goals uh, to really kind of align all the work of the college and help people move together uh, you know, in one direction. Um, I will pass it off to Tom here to talk a little bit about roles. Great. Thank you, Karen. So in this slide, we're really looking graphically at, at how you might organize around SEM planning and also just generally around SEM discussions and SEM organization on your campus. You know, there are formal structures about SEM. Who reports to whom? Is there an enrollment management unit on your campus or your, at your college, those type of things? But really, this is about almost the informal structure of SEM. How do you organize across the institution to be inclusive, but also be clear about who's in charge, who's doing what, what are the roles that various people play? So I'm going to just take a minute and talk a little bit through this slide graphically for you. And as a reference, this also appears in Chapter 28 of the Handbook of Strategic Enrollment Management that came out in late 2014 from ACRO. And uh, if you want more information, I suggest you might want to reference that handbook. Uh, this is the chapter 28 is the one that Bob Bontrager and I wrote uh, about uh, organizational issues in SEM. And so you may find some more detail that uh, would go beyond what we can really cover in this uh, today. So at the very top, I think you, you see there what Karen was referencing is that linkage and support to the institutional um, hierarchy, the executives. 
And executives really see that big picture, the strategic enrollment, uh, uh, strategic plan of the institution, how enrollment ties to the strategic plan of the institution, and also the budget of the institution. Uh, that linkage would be between uh, your chief officers, executive, academic, student affairs, et cetera, your board or overseers, whatever organization may um, oversee or govern uh, the institution. And they provide that linkage between this effort and the many other strategic planning efforts on your institution. Just underneath that, we see what I'm t terming here the SEM Steering Committee. And this is a group that's going to be charged with really looking at the long-term enrollment goals and se securing the approval for the strategies, the initiatives, et cetera, through whatever channels may be required or appropriate or culturally normed on your campus. That's what the SEM Steering Committee is going to do. They're also going to make sure that the plan stays on track, that you're actually on time, and, and making sure that you're doing what you said you were going to do and not letting this process uh, go on and on for you know, 18 or 24 months. Uh, we've seen that happen with institutions where they just get waylaid by the process. So the steering committee's tasked with doing that as well. They're also uh, tasked with being the point for communication among all these teams. And we'll go down into these various teams and, and talk a little bit more about these and, and why we have these uh, various uh, teams put in place or suggested. So on the left side, you'll see the Recruitment Council. And so that really is focusing on recruitment, marketing, et cetera, the intake or the initial enrollment of students. And so whatever that means for your institution, you want to uh, assemble a group of people uh, in that area. And on the right side, you'll see retention. So that's retention, success, completion, et cetera. Um, and you may already have a group on your campus that, that may be tasked with uh, retention or looking at retention and completion. No need to reinvent it, but you might want to look and say, can we retask that group to form the retention council that would be required in the SEM planning effort? And why do we separate retention from recruitment and not just have one big group working on this is the age-old conundrum, which is that um, if you ask people, well, why aren't we retaining more students, they'll say, well, we need better recruitment. And of course, if you ask recruitment, well, why aren't we re you know, retaining more students, they'll say, because you know, faculty need to do a better job, and student affairs needs to do a better job of keeping the students we have. It'd be a lot easier to get better students in the door if we had better retention and student success. And what happens is that both sides kind of point at the other, and it re reaches a stalemate where nothing really changes or improves or gets better. And, and my philosophy on this is that there's so much work to be done in both areas that you need to separate these apart and focus both on the intake and, and marketing and branding of the institution, the position of the institution, as well as the retention and success. So both have lots of work to do, and they need to figure out the, the focus of their goals and what they're both going to work on to improve the institution. I'm going to skip just a, a little bit down to the bottom here and talk about the data team, which appears in, in the bottom box of your slide. And in that team, uh, I want to make sure you understand that in all of these, you should be including faculty in every team that you have. And so in that data team, you want to make sure that you've got your institutional research person, uh, people who understand the, the nuances of data in financial aid, and, in, and of course, the registrar and in admissions, and so that you're really able to pull together a lot of research and data that's going to inform the process. And, and graphically, it's shown at the bottom here, but I think of it as the foundation that upholds the entire process, and all of SEM is supported by and influenced by the use of data. And so that data team is a very important anchor or foundation of this entire structure and process. I want to talk a little bit now just about those two little uh, boxes dangling off there, which are subcommittees. And now, subcommittees can be very important and very helpful in a SEM planning effort in clarifying roles. Because when you start a SEM planning process, you probably aren't positive as to what your initiatives and major goals are going to be at that point. And as you get into it, you may discover that the people you put on the recruitment or retention council 
we're fine, inclusive, well-represented, et cetera, but you may lack the expertise or you may want to add on some people to the process so that you really have uh, more people in a certain area working on a specific plan or a specific uh, objective. I'm going to steal something from Mike Riley, the executive director of ACRA, who said that a good committee fits in a minivan. And you want to keep these groups small <laughs> enough to be nimble in the process and moving it along. But that means balancing it with inclusion and getting a lot of people on board makes it tempting to have these very large groups, you know, retention councils of 30 and, you know, uh, 28 people on a recruitment council. And that can be devastating to the, to the actual completion of this. I recommend that you shrink those down into really smaller groups, but use subcommittees as a way to expand the membership of your, of your groups, involve other people on your campus without weighing down the entire uh, committee structure into such large groups that you can't find time to meet or that you may not get work accomplished. Okay, I'm going to show you one more version of this, which is actually this uh, version that shows here, which essentially takes off the top layer. And this one is probably most appropriate for those of you at smaller institutions, where essentially the president's cabinet may turn into your steering committee. Uh, there isn't that additional complexity or layer where the executive committee and then a steering committee may be needed. So if you are at a smaller institution, you may want to consider this type of arrangement, which is very similar to, this, to the earlier slide, uh, may be more appropriate for those, uh, those of you who have uh, fewer people, really, that are going to be involved in the process overall. I want to spend just a couple minutes here before I turn it back over to Karen and talk about institutional culture, because in the work that we've done at ACRO in helping institutions uh, write uh, SEM plans and implement SEM plans, this is an area that often gets neglected but is absolutely critical to uh, undertaking the planning process and also the implementation process. And Karen referenced this a, a little bit when she talked about you know, having the right people on board or, or understanding who to put on uh, various uh, committees or, or the work of the planning process. I want to start with, you know, SEM plans always happen at different points in time and for different institutions. And one of the things to ask yourself as you're thinking about SEM planning, what are the biggest problems you're having in enrollment at that time? What are you trying to address? Well, SEM is a comprehensive process that really addresses the intake, uh, the transition, the ongoing success and the completion of, in, uh, of students at an institution. Most of the time, institutions have something that's a point of pain for them. For some institutions, it's recruitment. For others, it's retention. For some, it's uh, graduation completion. And you want to understand what is it you're really trying to solve through SEM planning and through implementing this long-range strategic planning process. The second is, how ready are you to write a SEM plan? Uh, this is an area where uh, at ACRO Consulting we get involved in going into institutions and actually helping them uh, diagnose whether or not they're going to have problems uh, implementing a SEM plan, even if they write one. So you have to ask yourselves, culturally as an institution, can you bring people on board, bring them together? Um, do you have operational issues that you really need to address, uh, which can't be solved by SEM planning, by the way? Um, or are you really um, on board and ready to go? Maybe this is not your first SEM plan. Maybe this is your second or third SEM plan. And do you have the right um, leadership buy-in? Uh, do you have the right momentum happening on your campus that now is the right time to undertake the SEM plan? Think about who has to be included to legitimize the process on your campus. Uh, we all have you know, the, the faculty ombudsperson or the spokesperson who really represents, you know, the voice of faculty. And is that person included here? Does that person need to be included in order for this to be considered a legitimate process? Um, is it being assigned to only one office or one administrative <coughs> unit? Uh, that can also delegitimize the process by not having enough inclusion. Think about on your campus at your institution, how are other task forces appointed? In, in some ways, a SEM planning group is a task force. 
and it's doing some work uh, on, a, on a fairly accelerated basis. Don't, don't try to uh, upend that process or that norm on your campus, but make it fit into that uh, way in which they're appointed. Maybe that's a memo that comes out from a provost, or maybe that is very informal on your campus, but make sure and, and, and uh, follow that. Think about your executives, and are they hands-on or hands-off? Do they want to be involved in the details, and do they want to be involved in the decision-making, or are they really looking for a list of recommendations that comes from the group, and they want to consider those and maybe ask a few questions? You know, executive involvement needs to follow what, how they want to be involved in the uh, process. And I will say, e even at some very large and complex on institutions, some executive sponsors want to be very involved in the, in the real nitty-gritty of the STEM plan. And then make sure you clarify the difference in your groups and the roles between recommendations and decisions. Essentially, your uh, recruitment council, your retention council, are going to make recommendations on what needs to be implemented but without the uh, control of budget, without the ability to check and see if those align with or conflict with other strategic plans, it's not really possible for those to be decision-making bodies. And so make sure and clarify the expectations before you start STEM planning of what people will be doing. Are they being asked to work on something and create recommendations? Or are they being asked to do something and come in and really make decisions on what will happen? Okay. Uh, Karen, would you speak a little bit about community colleges? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it would be great to know how many of you out there were actually from community colleges. It's always interesting when you're talking to a group of people to find out. Um, I think some plans traditionally in the community college environment are, are relatively new and are not found as often as they are in the four-year environment, if, you know, for a lot of different reasons. I think you know, that given the nature of community colleges and, a, and a, a mission of open access, I think sometimes traditionally we have thought that, you know, we, we get who we get in terms of the students that come to us. Um, we don't always have a choice of who shows up on our doorstep, and our mission is to serve everyone. Um, that does not mean, though, that we can't be strategic about, um, you know, targeting certain groups of students for recruitment purposes and obviously be, being very intentional about uh, retention, more specifically, even in the in the in the um, community college environment, completion has been such top of mind for everybody as um, as, as state subsidy has changed in a number in, in a number of um, of locations around the around the country. States have changed their funding models. Uh, you know, we we were getting funded in many cases on enrollment, and now in many cases we're getting funded on retention and completion, and that really changes the whole story for for community colleges and many four-year institutions as well. But I think in general, I think, um, it, you know, in the community college environment, STEM plans are just not as commonly found, and, and people don't think, uh, think that they're maybe needed um, as they are in the four-year arena, and I, would, and I would argue that, obviously. I think that, the, that you have to have a plan, you have to know where you're going, and you have to be able to align the work of everybody at the institution, so you're moving in a common direction, and you all know what the goals and you know the goals and targets are uh, across the board. What are the priorities? I think sometimes because of that tradition of not having them, or them not being as common, that it's sometimes harder to get the buy-in and 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 convince uh, uh, convince administrators, convince faculty in some cases that it's necessary. Um, but it, but again, you know, really being able to outline your goals in terms of recruitment, retention, and completion in, the, in this case, um, being able to understand who your targets are, what your goals are, being able to, to make the case that all of what you're doing ties to the strategic plan of the institution and everybody is on the same page, um, it really uh, makes sense in, in terms of a business case, in terms of aligning work, um, we all have way too much to do and way too many priorities to be doing things that don't align with the agreed upon goals and initiatives. And, and this really, and again, this really is able, is able to provide a roadmap for the institution in terms of enrollment planning. 
Um, who are the key stakeholders? Tom talked a lot about this in, in, in general terms, but again, I would, I would say, as he did, you know, every institution is different, um, and there's an appetite, you know, for um, certain, certain things at different levels. You know, we talk about having a data team, um, and as important as that, as that is, at some institutions, the data team may be one person. Um, and so you have to understand how to retrofit this model to make it work for your particular institution. The same players are important. They may be called something different. You may not have a, a, re a recruitment council or a retention council. You may have success teams. You may have a student affairs team that is responsible for enrollment planning. Um, you know, every, every institution is different, and you've got to figure out who are those key stakeholders at your institution. Obviously, academic affairs, student affairs, enrollment planning processes. Uh, you know, Tom mentioned the registrar's office. Um, your business folks, the folks that are doing forecasting from your, from, from your administration and finance area. Obviously, your data IR folks, faculty are, are, are key to the institution. And, and Tom mentioned as well, um, you know who your key folks are at, at your particular um, campus or college. You know, your faculty union presidents, if you have those, if you have um, faculty leadership, faculty senate leadership, you know, get, getting their assistance to identify the right faculty to participate in, in the manner of, that which your institution does those things is really important. And then, and then defining the different market areas. Um, it, again, the, the two-year environment is, is different than the four-year environment. You know, you're, you're talking, you know, um, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and, and seniors. Um, you know, you're, in many cases, you're looking at, you know, your new from high school student, you know, your 3.0 student, your honor student that's going off to college. Um, you're looking at different majors. Um, you know, in, in the community college environment, you know, we look at things obviously differently. We have many, we have many um, first time high school students, but we have what we call a delayed student, so the adult market, which is much, a much tougher target group to get your arms around because they're out there, uh, they're, they're out there in the work world, they're out there and not always easy to identify or find. Um, we have part-time students, we have full-time students. Um, we, we might be looking to recruit more students into the post-secondary enrollment program or improve our veterans population or for some community colleges, um, obviously much more like in the four-year arena, um, identifying and targeting international students. So it's important um, that although the, the environment differs slightly, the concepts are the same. We just have to be able to identify what those markets are for our particular institution. So whether that, that's four-year, two-year uh, differences or whether that's just differences among institutions, uh, really important to be able to identify what those market areas are, what those program needs might be, new programs, new academic areas, new program offerings that you might have, needs that you determine in your particular region or community um, around job opportunities where new program possibilities exist. Um, and those are the areas that obviously you want to think about or identify um, as, as being singled out in, in that enrollment plan as you, as you develop it. Um, in terms of uh, the actual STEM plan and the structure, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the basic template or the basic structure uh, of a STEM plan, what, what's included in that. Obviously, an introduction. We talked a little bit, uh, you know, uh, earlier about being able to make the case for, and I think that's where you lay out. You know, this is this is really is a roadmap to how the institution responds to planning for recruitment, retention, completion. However, you want to uh, however you want to make the case, but this is really your purpose, the relevance um, for why you're doing what you're doing. Um, we're going to go into these a little bit more in detail. Making the case for STEM, again, um, the same thing, the justification for why you're going to go through this, um, uh, you know, pretty intense work, and it, and it is that. There's a lot of information that um, you need to bring to the table to, to really um, tell the full story. So why are you doing what you're doing? Um, looking at then enrollment targets, high-level um, um, key enrollment indicators, goals, strategies, and tactics. So from the highest level, you know, what, the basic, you're trying to improve a, a recruitment. Um, and then the, the goals that follow from that, the strategies, and then the tactics or the actual action plans with metrics attached to those. And we're going to talk a little bit more about each of those. 
introduction again ties the, the STEM plan to the strategic plan and the vision for the institution at the highest level. You want to make sure you define the length of the plan, and it should again align with the college's strategic plan. If your strategic plan is a two-year plan or a four-year plan, that strategic enrollment plan needs to align with that um, overarching strategic plan. And then um, obviously defining the groups of students, the segments of students, the population that you're addressing within those within that plan. So whether you're looking at you know, freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors, whether you're looking at first year, second year, third year students, whether you're talking new from high school students, delayed, full-time, part-time, um, you want to be able to identify the, the target population of students um, that you're working with and that you're talking about in each one of those, uh, those goals uh, and uh, strategies and action items. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Tom uh, to talk about making the case for STEM. Great, thanks, Karen. I would even I would add to that very last point that, that we're talking about defining the segments. For those of you who are at, at more comprehensive institutions that may have graduate professional schools, that may have community uh, outreach programs, community education programs, make sure and, and clarify in your SEM plan as you get into the work whether or not you're going to be addressing all of your populations or whether the SEM plan is focused on a specific segment of your college or university. Okay, so that's making the case for SEM. So what goes into this case? Uh, you know, first of all, you have to, to do some level of environmental scanning. For, for institutions that have done any strategic planning in the past, you probably have done some environmental scanning already. And so build upon that. And if you're looking for more information on environmental scanning, you can certainly look at uh, the last, uh, last November's SEM conference or, or other areas with that in ACRO where we talk about environmental scanning. You get a lot of information to help you uh, to, uh, in this area. Uh, but you want to think about uh, specifically for enrollment environmental scanning, uh, what's the population doing in, your, in the area that you're trying to recruit from or the area that you exist in? Uh, what are the trends? Are they growing? Are they shifting? Uh, one of the biggest trends in the United States is the growth of, of students from Hispanic or Latino, Latina backgrounds. Uh, how is that impacting your uh, future uh, 5, 10, 15 years? What's happening in the workforce? Do you have new uh, employment uh, that's opening up? Do you have things closing down? It, are things shifting maybe between what has been traditional hands-on manufacturing to more uh, tech or service trends in the workforce? Um, looking at your competition, and competition is not necessarily who you aspire to compete with, but with whom do you compete for students as they come into your institution? And then where do students go if they might not complete at your institution? Where do they, they enroll? That might be a potential list of competitors. Looking at where you're positioned on tuition and fees. Uh, what is your expense relative to those around you? Where do you sit within that? And there are probably many, many, many other uh, areas that you might want to put into an environmental scan. That's the external uh, case for SEM. Internally, we talk about enrollment behavior research, or essentially what happens to students when they, get it, when they come in. Uh, how do they move through the enrollment pop, uh, pipeline? You may already have some retention or completion studies, so you could build upon those or roll those in uh, and into your case for SEM. Um, how do different groups of students move through the pipeline differently? What segments of your population are more vulnerable than others? Um, do you have any externally mandated retention and completion goals or targets? Karen mentioned the way that funding is shifting in our public institutions as ways of rewarding institutions, not just for overall headcount or overall FTE, but on looking at how they are uh, either successful or not successful with the groups of students that enroll. So you have to factor all of that into this. And I always like to ask the, the, the question, if you just keep going like you're going today, if nothing changes, what is the projection for enrollment five to 10 years from now? What would happen at the institution? And that often starts to drive the conversation about, well, what do we want to change? If you look at what's happening internally in your enrollment behavior research, and you identify these more vulnerable populations or, or ways in which students don't uh, succeed as you would hope they would, 
And then you look at the external uh, population and you, you say, well, what's going on around us? What were our opportunities? Where might we have challenges in the future based upon who we've traditionally enrolled that may be shifting away from us in our demographics? Or where are the programs that we need to be adding that uh, we may need to, to be competitive in really reaching the students we're trying to serve? If you start to look at that mix of data and look at making the case for SEM, what you will find is that your, your uh, areas of focus will emerge from this. And in this background or case study, the research and the data often start to drive the conversation forward about areas that you might uh, need to focus on in the future. So now as we, as we get into this, um, macro, the next part, macro enrollment targets, we want to think about where the institution has been in the last five to 10 years, and really looking at your population segments. Every institution is built up of several segments of, of different groups. They could be um, first-time uh, students uh, direct from high school. They could be uh, transfers coming in. They could be returning adults. You might have military, et cetera. Uh, and if you look at those, trend those backwards for about five to 10 years. And then ask yourself, where do we want to be with these segments of our population in the next five to 10 years? Uh, do we, are we trying to maintain a certain level? Are we trying to increase a certain level? Would we be happy if we didn't decrease as much in five to 10 years in certain segments of our population? And those start to then really additionally add into these targets and these areas of focus, and these things really start to emerge. The third bullet here on macro enrollment targets is something to think about in your, in your um, speci specific institution. Do you have special populations, or what I call mission students, that are critical to the, the, the ongoing health and well-being of your institution? Uh, groups of students you know you're going to be uh, trying to serve and really trying to always improve upon, or maybe it's an area you're trying to grow, for example, underrepresented populations. Are you trying to increase the numbers of students from those areas? Uh, your key audience is required to establish or maintain health. So if you, if you lose a certain segment of your core population, it would be highly detrimental. And you need to make sure and pay attention to those really what I call bread and butter chunks of students in your enrollment that you have to keep in order to be healthy. And then look at your strategic plan, your institutional strategic plan, and those initiatives. Are there any things there that help you inform how you have to be setting your macro targets? For example, does your strategic plan indicate that you may want to grow as an institution over the next five to 10 years? If so, then how much? Uh, what is the target for that? And, and what would be considered successful if you were to be uh, hitting an enrollment level um, in two years, five years, 10 years uh, down the line. Uh, next, let's talk about these, and I mentioned these, these key enrollment indicators, the segments of your population. Now on this slide, I've listed several here to think about, and it depends upon what type of institution you are. Uh, notice we have a lot of community colleges joining us today. So obviously graduate, right, wouldn't apply. Uh, and there may be others that don't really apply to, to two-year colleges, but essentially all of them probably apply to most of us on the call today. Um, so uh, the traditional ones, freshman, transfer, graduate. But increasingly, what's the balance of your online versus in-seat enrollment that you may want to have uh, in order to be healthy or think you might need to be, have to be healthy in the future? How many campuses or campus centers do you have? And what do those enrollment levels need to look like five to 10 years from now? What's the role of adult learners in your population? You may be an institution that serves primarily adult learners or a very small percentage of adult learners. Do you anticipate that growing, shifting, staying the same, et cetera? And then when you think about your traditional service area or your catchment area or the area in which you traditionally recruit your students, how do you want that balance to look in five years? Are you going to have to go into new markets? Are you going to have to gain market share in your local area in order to hit your enrollment targets? And, and think about those. And then military and military affiliated uh, is a, a population that, especially in the US and Canada, uh, we concentrate on and think about how we can serve those uh, families 
You may have others uh, in your uh, KEI or key enrollment indicator groups. And then start to map out how these might change over the life of the plan, and they should add up to or be the, be the uh, subdivision of your macro enrollment target that you're trying to hit in the future. So now we're starting to see how all these, this research, the data, the number crunching, if you will, of assessing your enrollment starts to paint a picture for you, your faculty, your administrators, in thinking about starting to set some STEM plan goals. So let me turn it back over to Karen to talk a little bit about that. So in talking then about, you know, moving from the, the key enrollment indicators now onto STEM plan goals, which kind of flow next, you really want to try and limit the number of those. These are still fairly high-level goals. These are not the detail um, of the of the work, but 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 two, three, no more than three or four um, uh, goals under each of your of your key enrollment indicator areas. So if you've got something that is addressing recruitment or something that's addressing retention, you know you want to think about you know maybe three three goals for recruitment, three goals for retention. You want to make sure um, that um, your target uh, segments are addressed in those goals. Um, and you want to make sure that each one of them um, uh, is identified with a, a, a starting point and an ending point. So whether that be a quarter or a semester, whether it be the academic year, whether it be a two or three year period that aligns with your strategic plan, you know, it's really dependent upon each goal. Everything, every one of them is different. Um, and what you're trying to um, and what you're trying to accomplish, but you really want to make sure you define that with a starting and ending point. Some examples of um, of, of possible goals um, might be those that are listed here on the slide. You know, by a certain date, you're going to um, increase uh, the number of freshmen from a, from a certain number, uh, from 950 in 2016 to 1050 in 2023. Might be a percentage, might be a number. Um, you you want to look at retention of all students from fall to fall, and you want to increase it by a certain percentage by a certain date, um, similar to number two. Um, number three is about online graduates and, and, and growing enrollment overall from 500 degree-seeking students in the fall of 2016 to 1,000 degree-seeking students in, in the fall of 2023. You, you'll see from each of those that it has a specific number or percentage as a goal, very specific and a timeline in which to complete each of those. You know, another potential might be for the community college market. You want to um, uh, increase the number of um, post-secondary uh, high school students. Uh, the number might grow from 1,500 to 1,700 between, you know, the fall of 2017 to the fall of 2019, or will grow by 15% um, from one fall to the next. Those are the kind of um, high-level goals that you want to you think about creating in uh, under each one of your uh, key enrollment uh, indicators. In terms of some of the strategies that then flow from the goals, here you get you have the opportunity to get just a little more specific. Um, these are the major initiatives that will get you to that goal. Basically, might be something new. It might be something that you're continuing to expand upon that you've maybe had in place for a while and you want to take it to the next level. Um, might be something that's completely new, based upon a new or emerging market, a new program, um, and um, a, and, a, and again, might be an opportunity to refocus um, institutional resources, align dollars, align people. Um, all of those things um, are kind of the detail of how you're going to accomplish the goals that you've listed um, previously. Some of those examples might be. Um, implementing a new software, uh, maybe a new CRM um, to support recruitment, and uh, maybe recruitment of a particular population of students. Maybe it's um, uh, reorganizing your academic advising model uh, to better support students and help retain students at a higher level. Uh, might be a, a new institutional aid program, might be a new scholarship program that's been developed to support students um, in certain um, program majors um, based upon trying to build enrollment in, in particular areas or for particular programs. Uh, might also be uh, in terms of staffing, might be a new position. Maybe you're creating a, a case management approach to retention and you, and you want to hire case managers or, uh, or um, completion specialists or something 
uh, something um, a, a around retention that's a new initiative and you need staffing. Um, and, and it might be a commitment to hire additional staff to support students. Um, you know, it might be uh, about supporting service. It might be something that has to do with satisfaction and retention. Um, all those things um, help to define the strategy um, that you're going to, you're going to commit to uh, in order to reach the goals that you've talked about. Uh, back to Tom to talk about tactics. Great, thank you. And, and as you, you're getting the sense here, we're starting this, these very, very high level questions. How big do we want to be? Who are our major segments of population? Where do we want them to be over a certain you know, period of time into the future? And then we start to set from that our, our very focused goals at the top, the, the things that we really think we want to spend our time on in order to get to our, our long-term goals. Then the, the strategies that, that Karen just talked about, the major initiatives that we're going to have to undertake in order to reach these. Now we reach this very, very fine-grained level, which are the tactics. And in this area, I will tell you, this often separates away success and failure in the SIM planning and implementation process. Because you can do all of that first part, st uh, stating your goals, uh, some strategies, et cetera, but without well-defined operational planning, uh, most SEM plans fail. And so this is where we want to make sure that we've identified some very key things that are going to be important as you live into the plan over the you know, six months, 12 months, two years, five years, uh, once you've done the planning process. So uh, you want to look at these as operational plans and the linkage between strategy and operation. These are the details of the planning. This gets into the fine grains of it. You want to make sure there's clear delineation of tasks, that you don't just lump things into one statement but you really break them down into things like you may have to develop a survey, and then you may have to administer the survey, and then you may have to assess the survey, and then you may have to share the survey. So I'm giving you one example of ways in which you might delineate tasks to make sure there's a real understanding of what it takes to accomplish each of your goals and strategies. As we, as we drill down in then, we want to make sure that there's assignment of responsibility and accountability. Now accountability is, is the word I use here in a very positive sense. Not that you're going to chop somebody's head off if enrollment doesn't go up uh, the way you want it to, but you want to be able to ask yourself in two years after you've started this plan, now who is responsible for this initiative that we had? Who's the person that is responsible for this? They may have a cast of characters or a support team around them that helps them accomplish it, but you need to make sure you've assigned responsibility to individuals in your organization who can then be called upon to report out the outcomes of that. As you get into your SEM planning process and you're developing your tactics, you want to make sure and declare, what do we think is going to happen? If we're successful in this, in two years, five years, whatever the length of your plan may be, what do we think would happen? Because that's a way that you can then measure against that and say, how did we do? Did we achieve success? But it also very clearly paints the metric and the measure by which you will declare success at the end of this. Otherwise, you're going to turn around two to five years from now and look backwards, and some people will look at the number and say, well, that's amazing. What a great job. The institution was fantastic. Other people will look at the very same number and say, that was a failure. We didn't get far enough. We should have had this. We should have had that. And so you need to make sure you're clarifying this. And as you're developing this process and vetting all of these things, the tactics, that you're getting consensus around what it is that people are declaring to be success. And then, of course, the timeline and milestones. When do we think something's going to be done? If you don't put a timeline on it, it won't happen. It will fall to the wayside. People go back to their jobs and back to work, and they just get busy with the work of, of, uh, that they already have. Um, now, I'm going to show you just a sample uh, worksheet here. And this is just a, a tool that we use uh, to share with institutions to help them uh, it doesn't have to be done exactly this way by any means, but just as a, a way to frame this, you, you want to make sure that as you're developing your tactical plans, 
you understand what goal and strategy each one uh, supports to be, be very specific. Uh, who's the person responsible, as we talked about? What other staff or other uh, people are going to be supporting this beyond the lead person? And then you've got your action steps and in your measurements, which are very important. I want to highlight one area in the measurement. If you go over to the one, two, three, four, fifth box over, it says the data used for measurement, and then the sixth, the location of that data or what system it's in. If it doesn't exist today, you've got to figure out how you're going to collect the data. Otherwise, if you can't measure it, you won't know if you've been successful uh, at the end of that. Okay. So I, just a heads up, we're approaching our, the end of our time here, so I want you to make sure your questions, we're going to be looking for those. Uh, many people ask us, so where can I see a SEM plant? Where, where can I find some SEM plants? And the samples here that you have on this slide are all going to be available to you after the uh, session. Uh, I have the link to download this as a PDF, and you can click on these. These are all publicly available. Um, uh, uh, documents. The first one is an environmental scan. It's a really well done one by Indiana State University if you want to see what goes into that. And then the second one from Central Oregon Community College, I really like because it shows an initial plan and then it shows a second plan. And you can see how institutions evolve in their SEM planning complexity, clarity, et cetera, in, in doing plans. And then finally, the third one from Central Michigan University, another example of a really strong um, SEM plan document that you can go and see. And just to get an idea of what does it look like, we get done with this, what should a SEM plan contain and what should it look like? Okay, Karen. So to wrap up, we want to we want to thank you all for joining us. We we know this was a short amount of time, and I know that that Tom and I probably could talk for a lot longer, um, but we were trying to give you some uh, kind of the big picture um, uh, structure for a STEM plan. Um, as we as we talked earlier, there's a lot that goes into this, and so really having full support from your executive leadership is, is key to get started. I mean, that, that without that, it's really tough to make any headway and tough to get the support and involvement of everybody on the team that you need college-wide. Um, make sure that you've got active participation. The more folks that you get involved from all the different constituent groups that we talked about, not only will your plan be more inclusive and more robust, it will also kind of, it, it will create the environment um, to communicate more broadly. More people will be involved, more people will understand what you're trying to do and the importance of it, and that communication carries out then throughout the institution. It just makes that so much easier for you. And your plan will be, um, will be inclusive, uh, and um, everybody that needs to be represented will be at the table. Um, and, and then lastly, just make, sure, you know, make sure you really are understanding and aware of, of the cultural differences of, of every institution. Um, every, every single institution is different, and what works at one institution or the process or the structure may not be exactly what works at your institution, and you've got to be able to find the right balance um, and the right support and, um, and the, right, uh, the right way to carry this out at your institution that works. Um, everybody has to start somewhere, um, and so um, I would encourage you to, 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 to do that. Um, we are here uh, to serve as resources for you in that effort um, if you should need us. Um, and again, we want to thank you for joining us today. So I'll turn it over to our facilitator um, to answer any questions that we might have. Thank you, everyone. So while we wait for some questions, I just want to share some further information. Like all of our webinars, this presentation will be archived and will be found on our site. And you will also receive an email shortly that will include a link to the webinar and the PowerPoint for download. And just a reminder that we have another webinar coming up on February 22nd titled Creating Pathways for Success and Successions Through Staff Development, a Competency-Based Model. And some more information on that can be found on our website. Um, we did have a question come in, and I know that you had spoken briefly about um, having to define a timeline, but how long should it take to actually roll out a SEM plan? Can you articulate that a little bit further? Uh, I'll start with that one, and then, uh, Karen, please feel free to, to join in. Uh, so in most instances, when we're working with institutions who are trying to uh, write a SEM plan, 
uh, we'll tell them to expect a timeline of between 6 and 12 months, with the average being the median of, of 9 months. Just the, based on the experience I've had writing SEM plans for my own institutions or for many others that I've helped with, uh, that seems to be about right. Now, um, a lot of people will be surprised that it takes that long, but really when you get into some of these questions that, that are really uh, strategic and philosophical, how big should we be, uh, what's our focus going to be, uh, what are we not going to do in order to, to reach our goals because we can't do everything, what areas will we really pick, uh, those take a while. And if you're going to be inclusive about this and really ask for the buy-in and inclusion of faculty and staff and administrators, you have to allow time for that to happen. You have to have time to build the case and do the research and really do the environmental scanning. Those are not quick areas. And, and even as you get into some of the um, decisions about focused goals, uh, which strategies might be the most important or effective ones, you have to allow yourself the time to really wrestle with those questions because if we all had all the money and all the resources we needed, uh, you know, it would be easy, but we don't. And so it's really picking between those alternatives that often takes that time. If you're going beyond a year in your SEM planning, you should really be thinking about what's not going uh, as uh, according to plan here. You're probably taking too long to try and make decisions or waiting for people to all agree on things, which probably won't happen. Uh, and so that's why I say six months is very aggressive. That's a really short timeline to create a SEM plan. Um, Twelve months is probably the outer edge of it. And so unless you're a really, really complex organization or have something happen along the way that disrupts the entire university or college, uh, 12 months should be your upper limit. Um, so that's, that's my take on, on timing, and I hope that's helpful. Karen, would you add anything to that? The only thing that I would add is that even if you don't have a STEM plan, I, I doubt that any of you are operating with no direction at all, right? I mean, many of you have done environmental scans, and many of you, you know, have done, um, you know, research on programs, and, and your, your college president or executive team have laid out um, some priorities in terms of who your target market is. Uh, so many of you, some of this stuff is not new to you. It just hasn't been... Um, thoughtfully put into a plan and, and then and strategies may be developed for each of those areas. And so, you know, yeah, if you've not done an environmental scan before, it's going to take some time. And, you know, much of that, um, that research um, is going to take time. But if you have some of these components in place and you have a direction of, of where you're going with recruitment, with retention, those sorts of things, you may be on the shorter side of that. You may be able to pull, the, uh, pull together what's out there and then spend your time, you know, aligning the strategies with the goals that maybe have been established already. And so, you know, as we said before, every institution is just slightly different. Thank you. We're coming up on 3 o'clock, but I was hoping we could have time for one more question. Um, what is, you also kind of spoke about the buy-in, but what is the best way to get the initial buy-in from executives to support the SEM plan that might motivate an interest or coordinate collaboration? Well, I think the budget. I think, yeah, I think, I think just the fact that all of our budgets are shrinking. You know, support from the state, for support from, you know, the the region. If you've got levies, you know, everybody's budget is um, is shrinking. And in order to be effective with the dollars that you have, as those start to to dwindle, we need to be very strategic about how we're spending our money, um, and and what the what the products are of our efforts. And I think it, you know, I think this definitely gives gives you the uh, the ability to be to be very focused about where you're going to spend your dollars um, and lay out a plan for how those dollars um, can get you to the results that you need. And without that, um, you just can't be very effective, you know, in terms of your resources, your time, your dollars. Um, and really aligning all that work um, with everybody so we're all focused on the same thing. I think that dollars speak, right, when you're talking to executives. And I think um, being thoughtful about how you spend those, given that they're dwindling, is, is important. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that. That's a great response. I'll add to that that I've, I've sometimes run into people who are frustrated because they can't get people to get on board uh, and they don't get the attention from 
say the executive level, which I think was somewhat specific about this question, um, and it may be from other groups. You, know, you may have a, a faculty senate or a faculty assembly that's not on board. Uh, I think one of the best ways to try and get uh, people on board, you know, you, the old saying goes, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, uh, is to just use some resources, some sample things like some white papers from ACRO, some articles that you may see in the Chronicle or Inside Higher Ed or, or uh, publications that you have available to you in other countries, and to just uh, send along some links, send along some small things at first. And then as they become more interested in the topic, then you can introduce them maybe to some deeper things. Uh, you know, the SEM handbook, uh, I, I believe, is well over 600 pages. So, you know, plopping that down on your chief executive officer's desk and saying, you know, here, read this and get interested in SEM is probably a bit overwhelming. Uh, so start small and, and try to introduce them to the topic um, through the writings and the work that other people have done. And then as they become more interested, then try and, and create that urgency or sense of urgency um, I think also any time you can get one of your executives to hop on board one of these webinars about SEM, um, if you can get them to hop on board uh, uh, to coming to a conference or going to a, uh, uh, something about SEM that may be going on, uh, that I think goes a, a tremendous way towards getting buy-in, and I've seen that happen at many institutions where the lights go on and people really get it and they become very energized, whereas in the past they were a bit sluggish or reticent to take up the topic. Great, thank you so much. And I think that's that time, so I will close it out and hope to see everyone back on February 22nd. Thank you so much. Thank you.